What's going on, people? Good people. Vets, let's talk. I'm your host, Donald Hayden. I got a special guest in front of the formation today. Before we get started, I'd like you guys to press the like, share, and subscribe. You know the HBO special. Help a brother out. Hey, Chief Master Sergeant John Garcia. How you doing, brother? I'm incredibly well, Donald. Incredibly well. How about you? I'm good. I'm good. 22 years in the Air Force, huh? Oh, that was a long time ago. That was 24 years ago when I retired. What, man? You mean to tell me you're not 24? Oh, my God. You had me. Oh, I know I look 24 <laughs> and I know I act 21, but no, I'm a little bit more than that. That's good stuff, man. Hey, uh, before we jump into this, these questions real quick, you know, I know a little bit about your, your motivation. You're like a Les Brown platinum speaker, right? That's correct. That's awesome. So you travel to where I know you're tired. I had to kind of catch you on your, your, your downtime. Like, could you tell the people a little bit something about that? Yeah, absolutely. It'd be, be my pleasure. Um, I think we're all motivational speakers, first of all. If we all motivate somebody, even if it's just ourselves, our children, our spouses, our friends, whatever. But uh, to be a professional motivational speaker, obviously you have to do it for a living and make money at it. Uh, I met Les Brown after an unfortunate circumstance with my health. And we may talk about that on this call. I don't know if you want to go there, but... I met Les Brown and and uh, we partnered up and I've been fortunate to travel the world with the top motivational speaker in the world and share my stories and strategies and lessons from the stage, from the big stage, with some of the top names in the world. Not just Les Brown, but with all the other partners that he associates with, like uh, Anthony Robbins, I've shared his stage, wow. Zig Ziglar before he passed, Jim wow. Rohn before he passed. Um, Mark Victor Hansen, Chicken Soup for the Soul, Jack Canfield. I mean, I've, I have been so blessed uh, since I retired to share the stage with some really powerful uh, world-class speakers. That is amazing, my brother. Hey, this is like a common question that I ask everybody because everybody has a story about where they were and where, or what they were doing at this time. Do you remember where you were during 9-11? During 9-11, wow, do I ever remember. Now, this gets specific, though. Which year? <laughs> <laughs> 2001. <laughs> okay. Because I remember them all, all the way back. So actually, 9-11 uh, was a, a momentous year. We had just won a $4 billion, yeah, billion dollar contract. Wow. And I had left Hawaii. And I was living in San Diego at our corporate office. And I moved to Fort Hood, Texas, where we went to four billion dollar job and so i was just starting it up we were doing our congressional uh, um, commentary with the, with the uh, with the members of congress to make sure that we could get this awarded and i went home one day and boom there it was 9 11 happened the towers had been knocked down and you know, we were just, we weren't even started in fact we were only days away from starting but wow. uh, you know the world went into chaos and i had people from all the corporate leadership here and uh, we, we um, well, of course, as you well know, the world changed th that day. Yeah, it changed big time. Changed, changed me a little bit, you know. One of the reasons why I served. So uh, what do you remember about your days of service? My days in the service? Yes. Oh, gosh. What do, I remember a lot about those days. But let me start off with what was the most important thing, I think. Uh, the fact that I met some people from all over the world, all shapes, colors, sizes, uh, backgrounds, religion, it didn't matter. Everybody was the same. Uh, you and the army would talk about being green, right? right. So we were, we were all led the same blue. You know, we had our, our, our uh, green fatigues, obviously, but we were all the same shade of blue, regardless of our skin tone. And I met some great people along my, my years in the military, both civilian and um, the military folks and created some friendships that have lasted a lifetime. So that's the first thing I remember. The right. second thing I remember is that I got an opportunity to travel to places that this young boy from the humble background that I came from would have never had the chance to do. And I've traveled around the, the globe multiple times, had right. multiple opportunities, met some great people. I flew on a private jet with Colin Powell. Can you imagine that? Wow. Yes. I met President uh, Clinton, had uh, breakfast with him. I had dinner with President Bush. So I've, I've been, like I said, most blessed for, for my career. But those are two of the things that I absolutely remember, the people and the places we went. The third thing, and maybe the most important thing, 
is how discipline and esprit de corps and teamwork were such an integral part of our living. And it's really funny because that was on the on the uh, overt side, right? Everything everybody could see that. On the covert side, on the back side, on the underside, people are still people. The prejudice and the racism and the hatred, all that's there, but you don't see it so much because you're all wearing the same uniform, have the same mission. Right. But then the nighttime would come and then things could change. <laughs> but all great <laughs> memories though, all great memories. That's awesome, my brother. You notice that common thing that we talk about on this next question, the, the fears of things. Like, what were some of your fears transitioning out of the Air Force, if you had any? Oh, yeah. Well, of course, uh, you know, you you spend a career. Now, I didn't go into the military to, to, um, to make a career out of it. I went in because the job market had gone sour. And now we're talking back in 1973, 74, when the economy turned, gasoline prices went sky high. I mean, we were paying 60 cents a gallon, <laughs> if you can believe that. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> I know you're a young guy, but that was, a, that was high because prior to that, when I joined the Air Force, we were paying 35 cents a gallon. Yeah. No way. Yeah, well, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, and, and so the bottom line is that the, the economy had tanked, all the jobs were gone. Uh, stuff was happening and nobody could get a job really similar to what's going on in today's environment. Right. I mean, obviously there's inflation, but things have changed. And, and so I joined the air force and, and um, at, at, give me the question again, because I was going off on a tangent. <laughs> what were some of the, the fears that you had? Oh yes. The fears. Yes. Yeah. Well, so, so I didn't join the air force to, to be a uh, military career. I did it just to have a job, to have some income, right. but I loved it so much. I loved what it represented. I loved what happened and what I learned that I stayed and made a career out of it. And, you know, two and a half decades later, I was getting out and, and now I was going from what I knew because the majority of my adult life, all of my adult life I'd spent in the service. And now I was going to move off to corporate America. And the question was, do I have what it takes? Do I have the skills? Have I prepared myself adequately? Will I be able to make it in corporate structure? Because in the military, uh, as you all know, you, you, you walk in and, and they, they, take, they, they impose discipline on you. And then you have self-discipline. But still, all the time you're in the military, you're getting an order from somebody and you're, you're marching to somebody's tune. And, you're, and when you get into the civilian sector, it's all about you and, and you learning how to manage yourself, manage right. your expectations, and then meet up with whatever corporate expectations or job expectations that you're going to have. So you have to become your own person. So yeah, there was fear there. Am I ready? Am I able? Am I capable? Will I make it? Will I make enough money to sustain myself and my family? So yeah, that was that was the biggest fear I had. Other than that, nothing really. So so did you have a hard time adjusting to civilian life once out after 22 years? Absolutely not. No? <laughs> Whoa. So Absolutely. you mean tell me you 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 chief master sergeant, you didn't have no like I had one thing that I did uh, when I, when we retired, when I retired, we I say we the family, right? right. We went from um, we were stationed mainland and so we went to Hawaii for a month on vacation before I started working. And when we got back to Hawaii, where I had been stationed four times before, so I had a long history of 11 years of being stationed on that island. And, uh, and so we arrived at the airport, got the rental car, got our luggage, and went straight to the exchange in the commissary to get some food, right? right? Because we were going to be there for a month. And I, I remember my family got out, they're walking into the, into the, the PX, and I'm still in the car looking for something. And my wife goes, what are you looking for? I was looking for my hat, my cover. <laughs> That's the one thing that I just, I mean, it, it was natural, right? And then when she said, look, you're retired now. I go, oh, that's right. So I walked up with the family and we're walking in and coming down the sidewalk where a couple of colonels and some generals with all these stars. And I went to salute and then I realized that I'm in civilian clothes and I just kind of waved my hair back. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, you, yeah, that you, was the transition. You still got here, so that's that's pretty good. <laughs> yeah, a little bit, a little yeah. bit. It's turned a little little shade of uh of cool now. Right. Hey, so so do do you think the military gave you the tools to be motivated even when things didn't seem favorable? Uh, absolutely, and and not just motivated, but let me go step a, a step further back. Disciplined, because motivation only comes from self. 
right? I mean, people say, well, you're the motivator, motivate me. I can't motivate you. I can set an environment so you can motivate yourself, but I can't motivate you. It takes self-discipline in the person to be able to then be ready to be motivated and, and move forward. Yeah, I got all the tools I needed. I, I learned discipline. I learned uh, how to take care of other people. I learned how to take care of the business that I was in, whatever it was in the military that I was doing at the time. And and so all those skills and 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 respect above all, you know, Aretha said it best, R-E-S-P, E-C-T, right? right. To learn to respect other people uh, will then set you up for success on the outside. And so I didn't retire because I was ready to retire. I retired because I had been uh, recruited for a number of years by a couple of corporations who wanted me badly because they knew what I knew on the inside and they knew that, that all these services were going to be privatized and they were contractors. So they wanted what I had in my brain and in my knowledge base so they could be successful and win those jobs. And, and that's what we did. And that's what I did. And then, yeah, I was ready. I was, I was prepped. Uh, they convinced me after three years of meeting. In fact, I was at a conference. I was a, uh, wearing my uniform. I had just won an international award from the Air Force. And I was going down the escalator and the CEO of that company was coming up and he said, I need to talk to you. So I got down to the bottom, went all the way back up to the top and, and he met and talked and he said, listen, two years now, you've been putting me off. This is the third year. You've got to come work for me. I said, well, let's have breakfast in the morning. And we had breakfast and little did I know that it wasn't just me and him, but it was me and him and all of his board of directors having breakfast. And they were asking me questions. And I didn't realize at the time that we were actually interviewing. They were interviewing me. It was just casual kind of questions. Uh, they obviously, they liked me. I went back and within a week and a half, I called up the senior guy within civil engineering in the Air Force at the top level. I said, look, I'm putting my paperwork in now and I need to retire like yesterday. He said, you know, that takes months to process. I said, no, no, I need to go now. I've got a job that's going to pay me three times what I'm making right now. Wow. And uh, I'm not turning this down. It's time to go. That's amazing. So yeah. like with that being said, them kind of was kind of chasing behind you for so long. Do you think military personnel makes for the best leaders in as far as employment or business? on the outside? Uh, best, best is a big term and it's, it's hard to categorize it like that, but certainly make great leaders have all the tools to be able to be a great leader. Most military people that I interview, and I've hired hundreds, if not maybe 1500 military folks in right. my, since I've retired, uh, most military people that I've interviewed or received resumes from don't know what they have. And that's a big problem. They don't understand that. What I did differently than most people is I started putting resumes out before I was ready to retire. Right. And I didn't do it because I was looking for a job. I was looking to see if I was skilled enough to create a resume that would gain interest. Well, sure enough, I was, and it did. And I had people, <laughs> I had lots of job offers, but I wasn't ready to retire. So I knew that I had done the prep work. I had done some interviews. I knew I could present myself correctly. Um, and so I, I was ready. Uh, people that I know in the military, even to this day, to this very day, are not ready to retire. They That's have true. not uh, done the homework. They have the skills, but they don't understand how to sell themselves. And that's right. a skill that they need to work from. Right. So what advice would you give someone that's transitioning out of the military? Plan to transition. Plan to transition. The way you studied for promotion when you were in the military, the way you studied for the next mission, the way you studied for the next thing in your, in your military career, when you were PCSing somewhere else or going TDY for a mission, the way you studied for that, you need to study for your next journey in the civilian sector. You need to prepare yourself. You need to understand that, that leadership skills might be something different to the, the civilian sector that when you say I led troops, that means nothing to them. What right. did really, I supervised five managers. I supervised five supervisors who had a group of people beneath them. When you start talking in their language, when you can translate and transition, then it'll be easier. But you have to start preparing way before you retire. Too many people retire. And then the day they retire, they go and start to try to write a resume and try to send those out. That's the, that's a, it's possible, but it's not probable. That's not the way to go about it. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So, um, like, let's get into some of your your motivational. How, how did you 
kind of jump off into that realm, into that world? Because that is kind of a different world to jump into. Uh, yes and no. Uh, first of all, as a military, especially as you progress up in the ranks, you're a motivator. Right. You have to be. You're a leader. You're a motivator. Uh, if you're gonna send, if you're gonna take people into harm's way, bring them back, you gotta be able to have them motivated, right? Get them, get right. them up. So I was always doing that. Now, when I was younger, or towards the end of my military career, and at the very beginning of my civilian career, uh, I just wanted to help at-risk youth. So I thought, well, I'll go speak to these folks and try to, you know, motivate them, get them stirred up, and get them focused in the right direction. I didn't realize what I was doing was actually a profession that's a a multi-billion dollar profession and people get paid a lot of money to do that and i was doing it for free <laughs> and when you understand that it's a profession it's a whole different world well i was doing it for free and doing it for peanuts and helping out people and then one day i got diagnosed with terminal cancer and this was about seven years after i retired from the military and i don't know if it was exposure to some kind of chemicals or what but all of a sudden i went from being super healthy super fit to having a tumor that was so large in my body that it obliterated the renal cell, the, the kidney, the, the adrenal gland, and part of the vena cava going to my heart. And, and I was given two months to live. Mm. So that's a whole different story. We're not talking about that, but I need to segue through that to say that having gone through that and having survived and conquered that journey, then I made a decision on the back end when I came out of the first cancer battle, and I've had nine, by the way. Oh, wow. After, after the first one, I said, I'm going to do something different in my life. Because if I died during that surgery or during that cancer battle, what would my epitaph have said? What would my tomb home, tombstone have said? So I needed to make sure my legacy was set. And I said, you know, I told my wife, I said, I'm going to go and I'm going to be a motivational speaker. And I'm going to, I'm going to share the stage with Les Brown. And she said, do you know Les Brown? I said, no. She said, do you know if he's even alive? I said, no. And she said, well, how are you going to do all this stuff when you don't even know? if this, I mean, you, how are you going to get that connection? I said, that doesn't matter. The, the knowing how doesn't matter. It just, I have to cement it in my mind that I'm going to do this. And then I'm going to go find a way. Find a way, right? And I did. And I met Les. And, and Les and I spoke. And within i mean literally within minutes he said you need to be in this business full time and of course i made all the excuses well i'm a corporate executive now and i'm running this big contract and i've got hundreds of employees and he goes no you're not hearing me you're not hearing me that's good and that's important and that's the foundation for who you are but the gift of gab that you have the ability to project these messages you can help people out and you can do that by sharing stages with me what are you doing thursday so, well, let's see, I've got meetings with corporate and with this. And with... he said, no, no, what are you doing Thursday? I said, what do you mean, Les? He said, I need you to be in Hartford, Connecticut on Thursday. We're going to go on stage. Hmm. Now, the number one motivational speaker, the top speaker in the planet, Les Brown, asked me to share his stage. Most people, now that I've known him for 20 years, most people that, that get asked that shy away. It's like, I'm not going to get on the stage with that guy. But yeah. to me, it was like, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Right. right. And so, so I did. And that led to the next one. We went to Vegas and we went to Miami and Chicago and New York and all over the country and all over the world. And, and Les Brown is a real deal, the way he transforms people's lives and the lessons that he taught me. And I was a sponge. The lessons that he taught me how to deliver, how to prepare, how to have the stage presence, how to have the the message that really resonates with that audience uh, were impactful. And so, so that's how I got into that business of, of doing motivational speaking. And to this day, Les and I are still really, really good friends um, and, and share the stage all over the place. He just turned 77. And today he's in Orlando doing an event. Uh, if, you're, if your listeners go online, they can find it. Uh, I, many of my friends are there. Obviously, I'm not there because I had to be in Houston because I had a chemo infusion about about an hour ago, hour and a half ago. And I thank you. I thank you for giving me your time after after you having that procedure done. That's that's real big, and I appreciate that. And I, I'm pretty sure the people appreciate too. Appreciate that too. Well, I I look at it this way, Donald. God has given me a chance to progress in life, to still be here, 
And now it's my job to give away what he gave me. Right? That's the right. more I give, the more you receive. That's so right. I give it to you, I give it to them, I give it to your audience, and they give it to somebody else. And we perpetuate this thing and we quit having things like Ukraine, quit having things like politicians who are dirty, who, who take this country down the wrong path, quit having corporate execs who agree. We start to change the world, but each one has to reach one and each one has to teach one. And yes, we sir. do that, we start changing the world. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Hey, I was watching a uh, YouTube video, man, seeing this young lad. I think he was 18 at the time. You know, he was talking about the CIA, man. Could you shed a little light on that? <laughs> well, he, was, he wasn't an 18, but I know which one you're talking about. That was the uh, I think that was the first televised event that I did with Les. We had done many events on, on stage live, but this one was a PBS special in uh, Phoenix, Arizona, in, in this big center in Phoenix. And I don't know, there was a few thousand people in the audience and he asked me to go share the stage with him. Absolutely, I went. And he announced, he said, this is the first Hispanic who's ever been on um, PBS on a motivational show. Wow. And, and he gave me that honor. And he didn't ask the producers if he could do that. He just did it and called me up. You should have seen the panic on their faces when all of a sudden Les isn't on stage, but John is, who the heck is John? But I came on just like, like Les has taught us to do, like, like you get that training, right? And, and, and I had just a really short period of time. I think I had like five or 10 minutes, not even that, five minutes I had to, to give them an impactful statement. And I said, okay, I'm gonna speak about the CIA. And, and people looked at me like, oh, CIA? I said, yeah, but I'm not talking about the CIA, the people in Washington with the dark hats and the dark glasses and the dark coats. I'm talking about the central intelligence agency that resides in our own heads and our own hearts. You see, we have that central intelligence agency inside of us. And I asked a couple of questions in that, in that uh, God, I can't believe I'm, I'm going way back now. This has got to be 15 years ago. Um, I said, you know, the C and the CIA stands for commitment. You've got to be committed to the commitment and you'll be able to be successful in your life, right? The I was to invest, invest in yourself. You can invest in Microsoft, Dell, Amazon. Uh, you can invest in anything and get a return on investment if you're lucky, right? And you should be if you invest it wisely. But the biggest return on investment comes when you invest in yourself, when you educate yourself, when you listen to podcasts like Donald Hayden's podcast when when you listen to to youtube and ted talks and motivational speakers when you do all of that you're investing in yourself you're training yourself you're getting yourself prepared to win right so invest then in yourself commitment investment in self and the a was to have an absolute faith that no matter what happens because you're going to have naysayers people will tell you you can't do that you'll never get that you don't have the skills Whatever comes against, whatever mountain you come up against, if you have absolute faith, that's the A and CIA, absolute faith that whatever comes your way, you can get to it, through it, around it, under it, whatever, you can get to the other end. You can get to the peak so you can peak at the rest of your possibilities. Man, that was amazing. I hope y'all picking up what he's throwing down because that's all knowledge, wisdom, and he had everything he's talking about. He had the time and he's doing it. And he lived it. He living and he's still living it. And that's that's an inspiration. You know, I hope to one day be on that stage. You know, I will. I will. I speak it. I say it. I will. Language, languaging yeah. is important, my friend. Languaging is important. Be careful what you say. It'll come to fruition. So instead of I hope, I will. I will. And if you want to be on that stage, let me tell you something right now. I'll pick up the phone and I'll call Les and I'll say, Les, I know a guy named Donald who <laughs> should be on the team. And if you're serious, if you don't come half stepping, you got to be serious. And I will guarantee you that that less will will set you up if you're prepared to set yourself up. And wow. and I always say that to you. I'm saying that to everybody who can hear me. My favorite book says, "Let him who has ears hear." Yeah, and that's for your audience as well. They've got to hear it. My Thank favorite book also says something really, really important, and I want to share this with you and your audience. The, it says, if you had the faith of a mustard seed and did not doubt, you could tell the mountain to jump and the seed, surely it would. Now, I'm not preaching. I'm not a preacher, but listen to this. The faith of a mustard seed and do not doubt, you could tell the mountain to jump in the seed. People listen to faith of a mustard seed, the smallest seed in the garden that creates the biggest plant in the garden. Plant a seed, bring fruition, right? right. But that's not the key word. 
they hear, you can tell the mountain to jump in the sea and surely you would. And you go, how can that happen? Focus on four words. If you had the faith of a mustard seed and do not doubt, you could tell, you see, and do not doubt, and do not doubt. You got to get that in your head, and do not doubt, because we doubt ourselves. And when you start doubting yourselves, you stop yourself, mm. period. So do not doubt. That's the message I want people to hear. Deep. I hope y'all catching it. I'm going to put a little bit of information about John Garcia down below. I appreciate you for your time. I appreciate for you for what you do. And I pray that you continue to do what you do on a day-to-day -day basis until you leave this earth and you leave things within people. Cause you, you, you most definitely left something within me on this day. Thank you. So like, you know, who, who, who's up next for formation, man, this is best. Let's talk. Hey, once again, like share and subscribe. Hey, you know what I say? Victory. And our minds and power and our step. Let's crack that concrete. I'm out.